Hi guys, I'm Kiala. I am an entrepreneur on the island of Oahu in Hawaii, where I do lash extensions for women. I love making them feel beautiful and just giving them that time to come in and relax for a few hours. Besides doing lash extensions, I partnered up with an amazing woman. Some other things that we help them with as well is content creation for social media pages, videography services, and also photography shoots. We also do a lot of things remotely and virtually for them too. And we just want to make it easier for them. We really love connecting with other businesses and helping them grow on social media platforms. Social media is a powerful tool and we aim to make it accessible for those who lack time or expertise. Get ready for an exciting conversation on the Todd Atkins Show. It was nice to meet everybody. All right, so this is Todd Atkins, and I'm here with Miguel Edorati, and uh, today we're going to be discussing uh, The Rock joining TKO as a one of the board of directors, and also the UFC kind of quietly signing Kayla Harrison out of nowhere. You know, they made an announcement kind of out of nowhere. I don't think people were necessarily, necessarily expecting it, so it's kind of an interesting surprise, I think. And uh, before we start, as always, I want to thank our sponsor, Live to Fight Design, and uh, Bet Stamp, our gambling sponsor. And uh, you can find Live to Fight Design on Instagram at Live to Fight Design. And they make fight banners and gym banners. And if you use my name, Todd Atkins, you get $20 off your order. And I also have a website with Bet Stamp, which is uh, signupexpert.com slash TAS. We have all the different uh, sports books there, and you can sign up. For the various sports books there and uh miguel i kind of wanted to let you kind of give your opening thoughts on the rock joining tko as a board member with this ufc wwe kind of merger i think it's just wwe side for now but you know on the wwe side it makes sense uh, the guy's a hall of famer he was he carried the company for the years he was there it was it was a short run and he went off to hollywood you know um but people obviously, you know, if he ever showed up at a WWE event again, obviously people will remember him and his name evokes, uh, you know, nostalgia for the WWE fans. Um, what I don't like, and I think Nate Diaz was the one who pointed it out best, was, you know, he was at, I think, uh, I forget what way in, maybe it was the BMF title even. That, uh, it was. Uh, that Rock was a, a presence at the weigh-ins and, you know, George at least has come along enough that, you know, he kind of played along. But Nate's Nate, you know, Nate Nate's from Stockton, so Nate didn't give a fuck, <laughs> so to speak. And, mm -hmm. and he kind of said, this is embarrassing. Why is this guy here? Mm -hmm. That wasn't exactly what he said, but he wasn't impressed. And, uh, you know, Color Me not impressed either with, you know, The Rock being a wannabe with the UFC stuff. And, and just, you know, um, if, if you want to do something for MMA, put out the Mark Kerr movie that you, you know, bought the screenplay for and made out a, a run. And you know what? I'll, I'll tell you this. Go out and find the talent to play Mark and don't think that you're going to do it yourself at 50 years old. If you really want to help MMA, you know, but he's not, you know, there were, there were uh, you're, you're much more in tune with the Hawaii stuff and their conspiracy theories about, you know, Basically, how him and Oprah wanted to buy up the island and stuff like that, you know, and uh, that's more of what I think about when I hear about The Rock's name nowadays, more than wrestling or, you know, even some of his movies and stuff, you know, he's the highest paid actor in Hollywood. And he's a guy that's playing this game with these elite that, you know, people sometimes, uh, you know, find conspiracies in and, it, you know, he's got nine figures worth of money. He's, he's closing in on that billion dollars if he doesn't already have it. And um, more power to him, but he's useless to me in, in the MMA world. Completely useless. And this isn't the first time that the UFC's kind of been involved with him because not just the BMF thing, but also the shoes, right? The Rock had the official shoes where all the fighters had to wear shoes and they were getting no money from it, which they weren't yeah. happy about. 
yeah, you know, like I said, there's an elite playing the game there. You know, Damon may have joined that club at some point. Uh, the Fertitas may have joined that club at some point. If they were outside the club and, and just got big, then the club went in the form of Endeavor and uh, Rami Emanuel or whoever whoever is, is ahead there is, uh, you know, came in and bought them up, you know. And, and that's, I think, the corporate game, the um, the elite game that's being played here. And The Rock, like I said, The, the Rock falls asleep and he makes more money than me or you in a year. So what do we know? You know what I mean? Right. But do you think it'll affect the UFC at all, or do you think just just the WWE side? Uh, you know, if if he shows up at W at a UFC event and it's choreographed the right way, uh, re- remember the, w- the UFC is not above doing cheesy crap either. You know, they did. Uh, I, I'm gonna guard. I I don't watch too much of the uh, Hollywood stuff, but didn't uh, was it Jay Gyllenhaal? Uh, do a like a fake weigh in at, at an event, you know? The they fake film, fight. Like a, no, a fight too. They filmed a fight in the octagon. Yeah, so you know, I think, I think it that's was for a remake of Roadhouse or something. But then, yeah, you know, terrific. Yeah, that's fantastic. You know, I, the the point is is um, they monetize on that stuff in ways that are sort of incomprehensible, you know, but it, you did see that clip everywhere. Even it trickled down to me who, you know, I'm not looking for Jake Gyllenhaal clips or anything like that, but it came into the UFC clip. So I could see the rock falling in there and they'll get a few million views on that monetize on it somehow. And, you know, I think they'll eat some criticism from some of the purists, like, you know, myself, but I think even some of the younger generation is going to think, you know, that The Rock is, is basically, you know, a cheese melt that shows up at a UFC event trying to be a wannabe because he was never a UFC fighter. You know, it's not like Brock Lesnar, which is still conceivable that they would do. You know, if, if they put Brock in a promo spot for UFC, Brock's not great on the mic, but Brock actually has, you know, some UFC on his resume. Right. And so and, and some high level UFC on his resume. So, um. Yeah, yeah to, to me, Brock's almost like a better candidate for promotion and stuff. You know, the the uh, Dwayne has shown some, uh, like I said, upper level, you know, for lack of a better word, that Illuminati word, you know, that type of, of ability to handle himself, you know. So I think that's what his presence brings is he brings another power player, even, even beyond Brock, who'd rather, you know, go to his cabin in Minnesota. Right. And you know it's we haven't really seen we had talked about this when it first happened but when do you kind of think we'll see some of the the crossover or the effects of you know this merger well that that all depends on a few things right i to me the flirtation with uh top rank and bob aram you know, that will have to define itself relatively quickly at some point. And then you'll see a little more totality so I can see what they're, you know, they're waiting. The second part of the segment shows that the UFC doesn't wait for no one. You know what I mean? Um, but uh, I, I think that they will do want to see how that plays out. And if they have boxing involved in there, then I can see some type of... um stepping up of the activities among the three promotions, just cross promoting, you know. Um yeah, Brock Lesnar at Nganu's camp or at Joshua's camp or, you know, wouldn't Brock Lesnar be an interesting MMA opponent for Nganu's return? You know, if you could I know he's in his forties and stuff and he still looks in great shape and when he talks, I'm sure he'll do it. And he brings to the table a lot. In terms of, you, you know, you couldn't do that with The Rock, right? The Rock is, I think, going to sit on the corporate board and just make money. But that's the kind of possibility that now is open, whereas with the, if they're individual companies, you know, you, you don't have that chance, um, you know, because of the contracts and stuff, you know? What what if Lesnar would have show up in Tyson Fury's, you know, camp or, you know, Joshua's camp and, uh, you know, try to help them, you know, with the hype and stuff like that? Or actually become involved in something where 
a boxer does an MMA fight. You know, we've seen it in the past. Uh, UFC, the early UFCs, there was a bo- boxing presence. Um, they didn't do very well, right? Um, James Tony didn't do very well against Randy Couture. But you have to uh, uh, understand that those guys came into it as boxers. You know, what if a boxer actually said, I'm going to spend six months sprawling and, you know, oh, just take down avoidance. Because you can learn take down avoidance, you know, at a relatively competent level in six months, if that's all you're going to use to try to get back up. You know what I mean? You don't need to learn shoots. You don't need to learn real wrestling. Just take down defense. Big, strong, good athletes, good muscle memory and stuff like that. What if a boxer were to receive that and they were actually to do like Tyson Fury were actually to put his he Tyson Fury may not be the right guy because of athleticism. But what if you could get Joshua to put his money where his mouth is and he finishes Nganu or uh Nganu take you know they go the distance and Joshua wins again with uh or or even Nganu wins, right? Would how would you re if Nganu were to win, how would you recoup Joshua? Joshua's an athlete, he's young enough. Maybe he does, he says, all right, I'm going to have to go beat him in MMA. That's all I can do to redeem my name. And these things become possible across across the board. And the WWE, at the end, I think, also becomes a retirement ground for the guys that have cut their teeth and, and prove themselves big stars. Because you can, you, you know, I watched recently a, a review of the uh, 2023 uh, year. Obviously, we're, you know, still at the beginning of 2024. So let's look at that. And, you know, Bobby Lashley, you know, uh, uh, Brock Lesnar, those guys, they're still very active on the roll, you know. And these guys are in their mid-40s, you know, not really viable to be top-level MMA fighters, and you know, anymore. And I don't think they want to, you know. It's like they're 45 to get, you know, you need a little more testosterone, I think, to, to want to really get hit like that you know they do hard enough work and no one denies their their background right but you know i think that that i think that what you look at is a wwe can be a very good place for these guys to you know keep that momentum going if they if they've proven themselves you know keep the t-shirt sales going and things like that so i think that three-headed monster is very dangerous because you've got boxing that's very refined um and when a boxer jumps over to MMA and has some success, that's going to be big. You know, I, I grant to you, the, we recently saw Deontay Wilder lose. You know, Joseph Parker, who took him out. Hey, you know, Joseph may not be uh, right now at the top of the marketing shelf, but, you know, if he learned a little mic work and, uh, you know, talk some smack and things like that and, and actually would learn to sprawl, he, he might be one of the better, you know, guys – that could possibly cross over and do something in MMA. You know what I mean? If, if they were to take it seriously. So it, it, the top rank in boxing aspect of what this company could become is very important. I hope it plays itself out, you know, it, shortly, if, if it's going to. Yeah, I mean, I think the one guy we could, could kind of reference in that, what you're talking about, maybe like Mirko Krokop, you know, he kind of developed takedown defense pretty quickly. Yeah. That's all yeah. he was really focused on. He wasn't really focused on fighting on the ground. And, he, yeah. you know, and Pride well, is very I, I, effective. Yeah, and, and Alex Pereira, he, he's been, he's shown, you know, a 2.0 version, like a, mo- a much more modern version of a guy who crosses over. But I, I guarantee you the first thing he learned was takedown defense. Mm-hmm. It's like, where do you start? It's, you have to start with that, you know? And then you could bring them along. Who knows what the plan is, you know? Or explode them onto, a, you know, a big fight at some point. But um, that's what I think has to play itself out for the UFC, WWE. Are we moving alone or do we have this boxing third head of the monster to also bring along? And that's why I think that uh, they haven't pulled the trigger completely on any crossover stuff. What I would ask people if they can put in the comments, um, you know, is uh because I don't watch a lot of WWE, all tons of WWE, and, and I don't think Ronda is active right now. But if when she's been active, as she, if she's been active since the uh, the merger with UFC and WWE, have they shown clips of her in the UFC on the WWE? I, I know she did the fight with 
with Shayna? Did they show clips of both girls doing MMA on the WWE broadcast? Because that would be uh, something I'm interested in to know for sure. I'll look it up afterwards, but if you could put it in the comments, that would be great because that would that's that's a sign of the next step. That's a sign of what they were doing. And and you can see um, maybe in a Lesnar package uh, uh, with Lesnar, did they take some of his UFC clips of him winning the championship and put it on his inter, you know, his uh, hot clip or, or whatever you want to call it with the UFC, uh, the WWE? Has there been crossover in the video department? Bobby Lash is another one. I don't think they want to use CM Punk's, but you know, you know what I mean. Um, so yeah, I think. There's a lot of potential there. It, the video package is just a small sign of them starting to delve into it. But I think that what it is is basically they got to develop new videos of, of the crossover, of them going back and forth and doing whatever and, and, and muddying the lines between the sport and, and the UFC and the WWE. And that's if they have to go forward alone. If, if boxing is there, then boxing brings its own you know, it's a lot to try to meld together. And, um, you know, they have a lot of assets. It's just they're basically every asset. Yeah, and uh, I know that WWE recently moved their Monday Night Raw, or will be moving their Monday Night Raw content to Netflix. So wow. Netflix is now going to have live wrestling content for the or live sports content. I mean, that's going to be their first foray into live sports. Um, so that'll yeah. be interesting to see how that plays out. Yeah, but just like that's that's the main thing, and you, we could transition to the PFL with this. Is that's the main thing that set the UFC apart? That when they merged with the WWE, they was a peer is in their distribution. They're worldwide. Like I, I, I can watch WWE here in Central America. People watch it in South America. It wasn't that way fifteen years ago. You know, you couldn't just catch it or anything like that. They and uh, you, it was mixed in there with a lot of local shows, like even in Mexico and stuff. They have a lot of pro wrestling that goes on, but it's not the level of the WWE. And now the WWE is in the Mexican market, and even the Mexican market understands, I think, that when they're watching the top shelf Mexican guys, it's still kind of a regional thing. And the the regional scene in pro wrestling was there. You know, 30 years ago in the United States and, you know, the WWE ran it over. And now that regional scene, rather than just having the entire American market, the WWE basically owns the world market. And you could say the same thing about the UFC, basically. They're distributed all over the world. We can watch them here on the ESPN channels and you, you don't miss a show and there are rerun shows and there are all kinds of things like that. And, uh, you know, you don't have another company in either you know, in either sport that's uh, competing anywhere near that level. With top rank, you know, boxing is kind of marketed differently. But again, you don't get much better distribution than top rank. So if they come along here, now you're talking about a union of, of sort of peers that are all, uh, you know, playing at a high level already. And and that's very notable. You know what I mean? It's like the, the PFL and Bellator union doesn't bring any of these nuances to the table all right and before we get into that i'm just gonna do a little read on our bet stamp here and uh when your community wins with us we want to ensure that you've maximized your return on investment line shopping for the best odds matters and that is why any profitable sports better needs to be using multiple sports books thankfully there's never been a better time to get signed up and we are here to connect you with the best promotions industry-wide Using our link at signupexpert.com slash TAS, you can get access to all the sports books in your region, along with a review of each platform and its unique features. Most importantly, this page automatically connects you to the top promotions at each, sport, each book, allowing you to start line shopping with an enhanced bankroll. If you want to take advantage of these benefits and support our brand, please consider signing up for your next sports book, sports book at signupexpert.com slash TAS. Now, Miguel, I want to get into this Kayla Harrison signing with the UFC. This kind of, as I had said before, kind of came out of left field. No one was kind of expecting it. And this is something that you had touched on with the Michael Page thing. 
you know, PFL probably would have made a big presentation of signing somebody, you know. Um, but the UFC is just kind of like a Dana announcement on Instagram. You know, we signed yeah. Kayla Harrison to fight Holly Holm at UFC 300. And they gave Kayla yeah. her flowers without mentioning the PFL, obviously, or, right. you know, giving them any benefits. And stuff. And Kayla deserves her, uh, you know, uh, decorated entrance into the UFC. I, I think she's facing Holly Holm. Mm-hmm. And and she's going to get down 135 pounds, right? So there, there's a lot to talk about there, and they didn't really talk about it, like you said. It's an Instagram blurb, you know. They, but uh, they, it's a it's a great match in terms of um, name recognition and you know Hall of Fame status and athleticism. They, these may be the two best athletes to ever do it on the women's side. You know, I, Holly Holmes in the Boxing Hall of Fame, and Kayla Harrison's a two time Olympian. You know, you can make that argument. Rhonda obviously will say, you know, she's the decorated one. And, you know, you've got other girls that, you know, have athletic acumen and stuff. But this may arguably be the two uh, cyborg, you know, a lot, very decorated. But a lot of people chalk it up to maybe, you know, a little bit of enhancement on the steroid side. And she doesn't have success, super success in other sports. Kayla and Holly Holm is, you know, a much more elite athletic endeavor than even Kayla versus Cyborg. So the UFC not only took one of the PFL's top three assets, but they put them in a match that's on the undercard of their event or, you know, in the mid card of their event that uh, pits maybe the two best athletes to ever do this in the UFC. So, yeah, they're head and shoulders above. The only thing I can think of for the PFL is that they are actually invested in the UFC losing the lawsuit and they're playing a long game for a few years. And I don't think, you know, I don't think they understand that people, you know, because of the, uh, you know, appeals and things, it's not going to be resolved where the you know, fires are going to be accessible from UFC contracts for a couple of years. If they lose the lawsuit in April, May, June, that time frame, they're going to appeal and things are going to go on the same what you're, we're seeing now is going to be the landscape for the next couple of years. Now, you could say we're going to wait for that and then maybe they're concentrating on Europe and stuff like that. But they seem to still be dropping the ball. You know, if they're concentrating on Europe, wouldn't that that would lift Michael Page on your checklist of assets? He's British, right? Mm-hmm. So, you, you know, why would you let him go? Why would you have him? Why would you leave yourself vulnerable and have him in a contract where he can leave? You know, why would Kayla not have received some type? Why Why are these fighters even available is, is the question. Maybe they say, oh, it's going to be a couple of years, so we're, we don't really care about the American market. Okay, that makes sense, but there's only so many times that, that you can really um, turn the fans off that they'll forgive you and then you know you become a nothing and they're really close to becoming a nothing you know at this point with um you know the big announcements i saw of them in in this coming they're they're announcing you know finally they're back you know next year in march the um again they went heavy on the uh um uh the european league with uh the french kickboxer and they got a, a, a the opponent looks fantastic, you know. They they look like athletes. At least that's, you know, harken back to the John Perry days at USC. John Perry was sort of famous for the eye test, that you kind of have to look like a fighter. You know what I mean? So uh, the kickboxer and, and his uh, Russian opponent, they they fit the bill there. But at the end of the day, you're, you know, headlining with guys with seven or eight fights. You're, that's not top level stuff. You, I give you the example of like Cody Garbrandt and stuff like that guy. If you rush guys into titles, with they have ten fights, we've seen it a lot that they unravel because they just don't have the experience to be at the top top level. So if you're, they're going to keep getting great opponents for him, and, or you know pull opponents from other places, and all of a sudden have access to guys like Sean Strickland and stuff like that. Then those those other guys with ten fights and stuff should be lower on the pecking order. So, I'm, you know, maybe they decide to, to go heavy in, in Europe, but they let Michael Page go. So, I, you know, the uh, 
the presentation from PFL always seems to be this way, where you know you 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 question as a fan what they're doing, and, and you're rooting for them to do well, you know, but you question as a fan how arguably heading into the merger with Bellator, you had Ryan Bader, Michael Page, Kayla Harrison, um, you know, uh, Cyborg. You, there, there's probably one more the top five assets that they had. And, they, you know, Nganu is one of them. So they've hung on to Nganu, but they've let Nganu go off to boxing. Nganu would have been the number one asset there, obviously. You know, just sorry, sorry to forget him at the beginning there. But, you know, so they, they've decided to let him box. Okay, so fine. Just, so what are they doing on that? And I don't know. Again, waiting. Um, Venom Page, Kayla Harrison in the ring, arguably the two two best, most recognizable people that put in the work from the rosters that they had. And they're both gone. They're both gone to the UFC in a blink. You know, I, I don't think you can allow that to happen as that way, not have a, a, a great response or, you know, move on and say, look, we got Couture versus Lydell next week and blah, blah, blah. You know, the follow-up, their, their follow-up is like, hey, yeah, we'll be back in March with two guys you've never heard of from France and Russia fighting. They're really uh, neglecting the American market. And like I said, it, it might be a strategy that they decide to let it go for strengthening in Europe for a couple of years until the UFC is broken by the lawsuit. You know, Don Davis is good uh, lawyers. I can imagine, you know, lawyers are doing an assessment of the lawsuit and people are looking at it. And, you know, I, I, my amateur opinion is that the UFC is vulnerable because Dana was very uh, public and bullheaded about, you know, something we know as insiders, some of the, uh, dirty kind of pool that they played from the early days on and stuff in order to become the, the monopoly that they are, you know? So they, they, they may be vulnerable with the lawsuit, but you know, you can't take losses for two years until the lawsuit plays out because then what you look at is, is an adir, the bottom of what you have, you know, it, the UFC's what they built bottoms out. And now we're at back into, you know, the dark ages where you're seeing small stuff, you know, because the PFL isn't going to be able to lure John Jones for a million dollars. Right. And you also have the court of public opinion. Yeah. You know, yeah, they, they, every PFL's one of these. Basically, since signing in Ghana, they've pretty much taken nothing but L's in the court of, court of public opinion. You know, it, I'll tell you this. From what I can see, they got off and they finished their 2023 season, and they didn't cancel shows. Should that be the most positive thing we could say about them? Because there are rumors, and, you know, again, I'd like you know somebody to step up and substantiate some of this, but I've heard rumors, I'm sure you've heard the same, Todd, that the PFL, with their million-dollar contracts at the end of the year, that they haven't actually paid everybody yet. Right. And not everybody's satisfied with what they've received and stuff that they're, they're you know, how can you, how, how, how does that happen? Didn't you have, you know, nine figures of Kuwaiti money or uh, Qatari money or something like that to play with you? So you can't write a million dollar check? W what are you delaying about? Because the guys performed, they already did their jobs. So if that's true. That's the number one black eye that comes up for the company across the board that's going to, that they're going to say, you know, the lawsuit changes the landscape. Every UFC contract in 2027 is canceled. And everybody's a free agent. Why would you come back? I would resign with the UFC and whatever new structure they, they come back with, new, new business practices would still probably be run by sharper guys than we're seeing the PFL run just by virtue of what they've been doing. Right. Yeah, it's, I don't know what to. Do. How can you? How can you let Kayla Harrison go? And now, what's Cyborg going to think? Yep. You know, Cyborg has no opponent now on that roster. Just like Kayla used to not have an opponent on the PFL, but when they bought Bellator, you had Cyborg, so you were like, "Ooh, they have a chance." Now that's gone. So now Cyborg, you know, either you know she's older, maybe she retires. Hopefully, she's you know banked away some money, but. Maybe she goes back to the UFC. You know, and Cyborg's an interesting lady because Cyborg 
you know, it, should they sign top rank? Cyborg is a girl that you maybe you can get a boxing match or two out of her. You know, I, I, I'm not saying she's a top shelf boxer like a Katie Taylor or anything like that, but she should be serviceable for what boxing women's talent is. Mm-hmm. And certainly I, I watched, like I said recently uh, in the prep for this, some, some WWE, I watched Shayna and, and uh, some of the, the WWE ladies in 2023. And I, I tell you, Cyborg could be put in there as a very scary type of, you know, uber athlete kind of thing. You know, a little bit bigger than, than the average girl on the roster, a little bit meaner maybe, and uh, a lot of MMA credentials and stuff like that. You know, Cyborg and Ronda Rousey in a WWE ring with, with Cyborg, bought, you know, I wouldn't put Cyborg on the mic. I'd give her, you know, a manager with somebody who does the talking and stuff and just let her be looking like a freaking cyborg in, in, you know, every promo. And she would play that role magnificently. Mm -hmm. And again, with the boxing aspect, you could even juice a couple of fights out of her that way. You know, so who knows where she winds up, but she probably should be, if if I were cyborg, I, I wouldn't be impressed with the PFL and be dying to sign there. Yep. Yeah, it's it's kind of as an MMA fan, you know, if you're someone who's wanting to look for more than one promotion. Now, if you're just someone who wants to see the UCA, yeah, this is fine, I guess. But as an MMA fan, if you're wanting different um, avenues of MMA resource, it's frustrating, you know. To you thought maybe something would come of this, and and nothing's coming of it. Really, it seems like. Yeah. The- I mean, the bottom line is, 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 if you're just a UFC fan, you're just a UFC fan, and I can understand that's okay. Yeah. But if you are looking for there to be a com- competition of some way, sort, I, I, I'm not seeing it. I'm not seeing anybody who has a chance. Uh, you know, I, I think they've got a, a February 24th fight that they've announced. Uh, Going to be in Saudi Arabia. Uh, Ryan Bader is is the headliner. Um, trying to see here on their website no that that fight night they were gonna do that got canceled or they postponed it okay the saudi Saudi arabia well here's the thing ariel hawani said saudi arabia said the card wasn't good enough are you talking about pfl or ufc no pfl pfl versus bellator they have ryan bader right right uh, right okay yeah there's there's a still a go you're right okay okay so now you're in february and stuff like that but this isn't a total needle mover on the American mm. market either. Nope. You know, you got Ray Cooper's kid. You got, you know, some decent fighters. You got uh, Patricky Ferrer. So they're mixing in the PFL lot, uh, in the Bellator roster and stuff like that. But, you know, there, there's nothing really about this card that looks much different than the Bellator card. And I don't think it'll move the needle on the American market much different than the Bellator card. And if you ask the PFL to, um, you know, do the marketing and things like that at the UFC's level, they haven't shown themselves capable of doing that. And they haven't shown themselves capable of, of like, you, you know, retaining their best assets where, you know, at this show, Kayla Harrison should have been there. Michael Venom Page should have been there. You know, front row, just like the UFC does with their guys. And and bringing them along, showing them to the Saudi audience as well. You know, the sponsors over there and the people throw the money around over there like to have contact with the athletes. You know, so bring your best, your A-line guys. And, you know, they're actually letting them go off to the UFC. Yeah. It's frustrating. Now, I want to ask you, you know, Sean Strickland lost his title this weekend or last weekend to Drikus Duplessis. I kind of wanted to hear your thoughts on that. You know, a lot of people thought it was a close fight, um, you know, that Strickland may have won. Others said, no, you know, that Duplessis won the fight. But I just want to get your overall thoughts of, uh, you know, Strickland kind of, he had some moments before the fight where he had, you know, kind of like a journalist going at him trying to, get him caught up in some questions. And I think he came out of that pretty well, you know, but he ended up, you know, losing his title ultimately. What do you think about that? You know, 
first of all, my hats off to Duplessis. I, now you've got a South African guy who's held the UFC title. Um, that's kind of history, you know. Um, you know, another African fighter uh, joining the crowd there, a second African fighter winning the middleweight championship, uh, you know, black or white aside. Um, it's news. The the fight game is growing on a continent with a plethora of, of uh, raw talent that's sitting there that, that, you know, could probably be guided and exploited in the next, you know, years and things like that. So my hat's off to him. And I, I think he actually beat Sean in his own game. I think Sean uh, got caught up in, you know, Sean's usually able, to, like with Adesanya, the mind game, he won the fight beforehand. But I think actually getting under Sean's skin on a personal level uh, may have worked for Duplessis because I, I don't think, you know, I, I don't think he expected Sean's reaction that was so vitriolic. I, I think he sort of like was like, I mean, you can say all the things you say. I, I can't say that. You know, that would have crossed my mind. And and then he kind of backed off, said, okay, no problem. But it, Sean was still stewing. He, the, the work had been done. So we'll, we'll see. We'll see how Sean bounces back. Um, I still think he's kind of got that people's champion ty- type of uh, appeal. And I'm not sure that Duplessis is, is going to be like a mega marketable guy on, on the world level. Um, you know, we'll see if we get a UFC in South Africa. If, if But I think that'll take a, a few Duplessis wins and, and the you know, maybe Adesanya coming back in a, a year or two for them to go ahead and try that or see how that goes. But uh, more groundbreaking stuff. And, and, and that's the thing about, you know, the, the UFC and, and uh, you know, what they got going on. You had Sean Strickland lose his belt. And then, you know, this week you've got, uh, you know, fights. I did, they're off a week, I think, but you've got fights next week. And then you've got, you know, the TV show kicking off again. And then you've got, you know, Hermanson and Piper. And then you've got all of a sudden, you know, you're at UFC 299 in early March. And, and boom, 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 boom. By the time the, along with that, by the time that the PFL show kicks off for the, Feb, you know, in February, at late February, the UFC is going to do four more shows. So yeah, it's not even it's not even the same ball game anymore. But what I was really wanting to see from you is, uh, how popular do you think Strickland is now? You know, I like I said, I think he has that kind of you know, it's like I like rock and roll, right? So how popular is country music? Like, I think that's the thing. It's like, I think maybe I don't think he's, you know, he doesn't appeal that much to me, not as much as, you know, someone else. Like, you know, maybe like a Max Holloway or, you know, even uh, Khabib and those guys, like a different feel. But I think Sean Strickland has a very marketable side. You know what I mean? Um, And that's why I call him a little bit of the people's champion there, because I think that, you know, some of his background, some of his honesty and things like that, um, especially with the way America is now and stuff with, you know, the left and the right and all that nonsense and stuff. I think, you know, being polarizing like him um, and no nonsense and, you know, saying it like it is, I, I think that has definitely some appeal and that he's, he's, he's in a lot of clips, you know, he's, he's a guy that doesn't shy away from the media, you know? So I think, I think he's played his best game there. I think that's not, not bad. And I think he he's, had a chance. I wish he had gone on a run where he defended the belt five or six times, because then I think he would have had a chance to cross over into bigger money. Now with the stumble, the UFC is you know, hey, you took a loss. Now now all of a sudden your pay isn't the same, you know, and that's that's the issue there is that uh, you know how do they back him now? Where where does he pop up next and stuff? Because um, he was a guy. He's a guy I think that has a lot of appeal to people. Right, and that's one thing I'm wondering because UFC 300 doesn't have a main event. Do you think they'll try and turn around Duplessis on short notice and maybe have him? I mean, it's three months away, so I don't know if I want to call it short notice, but turn him around quickly, I would say, and uh, have him fight Adesanya. You know, is Adesanya going to be ready? because he's the guy that said he's taking some time off and this and that, the other stuff. So all of a sudden it's like, they've come up with enough money that, that we're going to see him in three months. Is, is that too much of a 180 in your head? 
that we're going to get a top shelf out of Sanya, or is he just going to come and cash the paycheck? You know, or and and if he's got right the right people around him, they might tell him no. You know, even three months, you you can't be ready because you've let yourself go for three months too. You know, and by that I mean just not training and you know just enjoying his money. He's a young man with a lot of money now and stuff like that. You know, I I don't think he's training for the world championship level in the last couple of months. That's not what he said. So, you know, what kind of, if, if I were him, I wouldn't come back. Not right. Not right now. Not if I can't get back into top shelf shape, top shelf shape, shape. You, you know what I mean? So, um, yeah, when the UFC wants something like that and they could, they could push for it. We'll, we'll see what they get. O- O'Malley might be, you know, a little bit of a better, uh, Rematch for Duplessis, if, if, if you know, a more accessible one. Uh, and and you know, would that serve as a good main event for 300 enough to impress the Saudis? I, I don't know, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what the Saudis are looking at there because, like I mentioned, I, I, I see a very good card. No, I'm, I mean, you know, Adesanya really wanted the fight with Duplessis, so three months is enough time to get ready. Um, it just depends yeah. on how unready he was prior. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, like I said, he also did announce, like I said, that he was going to be off for a couple of years. So right. w- w- now if he said, I'm going to be off for a couple of years and then you know, went into a secret training camp where, you know, he stayed maintained training at, at a, at, you know, at an elite level, which he's been at for years now, you know what I mean? And kind of, never let go, you know, of, of that aspect of it. Or like I said, did he go off and, you know, buy his house, buy his mom's house, you know, get a couple of cars, you know, hang around, hang around Nigeria, go back to Nigeria, you know, hang around New Zealand or wherever he's from nowadays and enjoy his life. Like I said, as a young man with a lot of money, he's he's got a prerogative to do that. You know, he may think I, I've earned it. He's been through the mill too, you know, because he's a guy that when you look back, was a guy that the UFC was trying to pit with John Jones. They were trying to make him into an all-time great. Right. You know, the, he had that push, and, and he actually is the one that fell short a little bit with, with some flat performances, and he didn't come in at times with the killer instinct that a John Jones or, or someone like that would have, you know? And with that in mind, when he says he took some time off, I would think – that he probably took some time off. You know, like I said, the secret training camp aside, even three months is not going to be ready to just jump right back into Duplessis' level. I think Duplessis is a guy that the stars crossed rightly for him, and this was his time. And, you know, he did his job. Well, you know, Miguel, as always, I appreciate your insight, and I want to give you a chance to kind of talk about, you know, we always like to let you talk about the... uh the rescue and everything that you've been doing. Um, so, well, uh, send me a message if you're out there. If anybody is a vet, uh, we may be hiring a vet full time here. And, uh, you know, so send me a message. We'll see if you're willing to move to Costa Rica and work for no money, basically. <laughs> um, uh, you know, we might have a spot for you. It's uh, a challenge every day, but it's, it's something, something comes up every day. There's a crisis every day. Um, you know, street animals, this, that, or the other stuff. So um, it's always interesting. And Costa Rica is actually one of the better countries uh, for animals in terms of human right, you know, animal rights and stuff like that. So um, I know there are worse places out there and stuff like that. But if you do care, um, you know, just reach out, reach out on the internet to a local shelter or shelter internationally, you know, in the country of your choice and stuff. They're very easy to find where the, you know, the suffering of animals is and dogs, specifically cats and, you know, home uh, pets is, is really horrible. You, even in the United States, you know, I, I was before signing on when I jumped on and the computer came on. It's like now I get lists of uh, euthanized dogs in Texas, euthanized dogs in New York, euthanized dogs in California, euthanized dogs by state at shelters. And these are only the shelters that have a presence on the Internet. At least letting you know the information. How many dogs die without even a post or a picture or a chance of getting adopted, even in the States? So there's a lot people could do to help. I, I wish more people would. That's all. 
And if you want to help, as always, we have a GoFundMe in the show notes here, and you can contribute to it there. And uh, Miguel, as always, we all appreciate your insight. You're, you know, incredibly popular on this YouTube channel. And, uh, you know, for everyone that supports uh, Miguel and uh, our content here, we, you know, we greatly appreciate it. And until next time, uh, take care. I do appreciate it. I, I read the comments yeah. of, of the people out there that, uh, uh, you know, I like I said, we, we don't have a million views and stuff like that. But I can tell that there are some like-minded individuals out there. And th that's why me and Todd do it, because, you know, we're always going to speak our mind. And, uh, you know, you guys give us strength in that, hey, we do it for you. There's not, you know, you give us a sense that, yeah, you know, we do have a point. We're right. You know, it's good. <laughs> Yeah, feel free to to uh, engage in more conversation. Uh, it's always cool to see uh, the like-minded individuals in there. I think uh, our uh, the community we do have is a pretty educated one. That's for sure. That's for sure. Yeah. Well, everyone, till next episode. Take Thanks, care, folks. <laughs>